All righty, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to speak at uh, this field workshop. And uh, to be honest, the title is actually fairly self-explanatory. Nothing, uh, nothing weird going on there. I'm interested in cross products. I'm interested in basic properties about cross products. And one of the most basic properties that's not trivial to solve is simplicity. So just to you know, refresh our memories a little bit, even though probably most of you already know what a cross product is. Let's say uh, I have you know, just a discrete group and a unit of C star algebra, just to keep our sanity here. And I have G acting on it by star automorphisms. And there's your group and there's your group action right there. So from there, I can form a larger C star algebra, which is very similar to you know, what the semi-direct product of two groups looks like. Uh, in fact, let me just set a timer for myself here. So it's very similar to a semi-direct product of two groups. And you know, if you've ever seen them before, you realize, okay, it should satisfy a few things. It should contain a copy of A, it should contain a copy of G, and I'm gonna call each uh, element G in there as lambda G. And it's very important, the action of G on A should be inner inside of this larger C-star algebra. So G acting on A should be the same as if I conjugate by my unitaries uh, lambda G inside of this big C-star algebra. And your intuition is that, okay, more or less, it should just be finite, uh, you know, finite sums of the form sum of AT lambda T, where T are your group elements and AT are coefficient in A. Uh, you know, these are the obvious, uh, obvious elements that you can form in there. And their multiplication is given, given as follows. So A lambda S, B lambda T, you multiply them exactly how, uh, how the product works for semi direct products for groups. So I can insert A lambda S star lambda S in there, because that's a unitary. And then lambda s b lambda s star becomes s acting on b. But of course, you know we're, we're analysts. We don't just like finite sums. We like infinite sums, and we like complete things. And there's always two canonical ways to complete this, uh, you know, algebraic cross product of finite sums. There's always a universal way, which is a sort of largest completion, and there's always a, a reduced way or a sort of spatial completion as well. And I actually haven't seen, seen this really written down anywhere, but uh, you can actually define the reduced cross product in a very, very nice way that avoids any sort of spatial representation or anything like that by just saying it's the unique norm completion that makes this map right here that sends a sum of AT lambda T to the coefficient at the identity. It's the unique norm completion that makes it uh, you know, a faithful conditional expectation. So in other words, the norm is large enough so that the map is continuous, but also small enough so that the map is faithful. And okay, let's just dive uh, right into the history of simplicity of these things. And whenever I talk about the history, I always like to split up the results into a few main classical results, if you will, that are very, very sort of hands-on, very sort of put some elbow grease into it. And some more modern results that use a bunch of uh, abstract nonsense, but work quite a bit nicely. And, uh, and by magic, they spit out exactly the results that you want. So the classical results, Probably the very first result that's important, uh, that was really important to this field of C-star simplicity was Powers' result in 75. We proved that if you just let A, in this case, be the complex numbers, and G be the free group on two generators, this generates a uh, simple C-star algebra. So in other words, the reduced group C-star algebra of F2 is simple. And afterwards, many, many groups uh, uh, that basically look like F2 were also shown to generate a simple C-star algebra. And in a completely different flavor, probably about uh, you know, almost a decade later, it was shown by, by a few different uh, authors. So by Elliot and Kishimoto in special cases, but by Olsen and Peterson in the very general case, where if you have a group action on a C-star algebra A, such that the action is something called properly outer, then the cross product is simple. And I'll, just, uh, I'll mention it right here. Always in this talk, actions are always minimal, because if you uh, if you have a non-minimal action, you can never have a simple cross product. It's as simple as that. So the important thing to notice is that this is very much not an if and only if, because take the example from before, the free group on two generators, its action on the complex numbers is very much not properly outer, but the, you know, the reduced group C-star algebra still somehow is, is simple. So that's important to keep in mind that even though it's, it's not a true if and only if characterization, but nonetheless, proper outerness will still play a role in all the future results that were obtained and will still play a role even in our results that I obtained. I should mention uh, before I forget, because I already forgot, this is a joint work with Shirley Geffen that I did at, uh, at Munster the first few months while I was there. Yeah. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, 
I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the history first, but everything that's on screen will be defined at some point. So proper outerness uh, for non-commutative cross products, very important. For commutative cross products, at least for amenable groups, this was also solved a few years later by, uh, by Archibald and Spielberg in the 90s, where they showed that proper outerness in this case really is equivalent to simplicity of the cross product. And in this context, I'll just mention proper outerness is the same as topological freeness. But on to the more modern results. So really these began not, you know, less than 10 years ago with, with the very breakthrough results of originally Kalantar and Kennedy and then a, a couple years later, actually I think very shortly later, Briard, Kalantar, Kennedy, and Ozawa, where they gave a complete characterization for all reduced group C-star algebras, regardless of uh, whatever the group is. In fact, you don't, even, you don't even need countability on the group or anything like that. So full if and only if characterization, and then a couple years after that, that should actually say Kwabe 2017, if I'm not mistaken. But using the same sort of techniques that were done for group C-star algebras, he got the analogous result really for, for commutative cross products. And then Kennedy and Schaffhauser a few years after that, they got the idea, okay, can we, if it works so nicely in the commutative cross product setting, can we take more or less what was done there and just generalize it to the non-commutative setting? And the short version is that they were able to obtain some sufficient conditions for simplicity, but they're very partial results in the sense that the converse requires a very strong assumption that's not, not really always true in that setting. And as I mentioned, this is the problem I'm going to be studying. When is, when is A cross G for non-commutative A? Simple, at least for a relatively nice class of groups. Alrighty. So, like I said, the old results, the classical results, were very, very sort of hands-on. The more modern results use a bit of fancy machinery. And what is that? They use something called the injective envelopes of your C-star algebras. And it's not actually that important what they are. There's just a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that they're sort of larger C-star algebras that contain your C-star algebra A, but they're still small enough to remember a lot of the properties about A. And they're often much nicer in theory to work with. Even though in the back of your mind, these are sort of axiom of choice objects. They're very hard to describe in practice, but they give very nice theory. And always the modern C-star simplicity results, they prove results on the G-injective envelope first, and their things work fantastic, but ideally you want to bring it back down to characterizations on things that you can actually understand. So if you can prove something on I, G of A, then you should say, okay, can I get something, a characterization on I of A, or very ideally on A? That's the end goal. So what are injective envelopes? Well, let's just get right into the definition, even though, like I said, the definition is not very important. So in the category of C-star algebras, with unital and completely positive maps as morphisms, an object injective if whenever you have a morphism to it, so let's say from A to C, you can always extend it to a morphism from a larger C-star algebra to it. And I of A is said to be the injective envelope of A if, first of all, it should be injective in this category, but in some sense, it's the smallest possible injective extension of A. So there's absolutely nothing strictly in between A and I of A that's still injective. I'm slightly lying here because uh, some details on inclusions being swept under the rug, but this is the main idea. And if you say you've never seen this before, well, you definitely have, because in the category of Banach spaces with continuous linear maps between them, the complex number is, is injective. That's the Hahn-Banach extension theorem. Every continuous linear functional from one Banach space into the complex numbers can always be extended to continuous linear functional on a larger Banach space into the complex numbers. So injectivity is not, not actually a foreign concept all of us. And of course, this was a non-equivariant version, but uh, that gives you I of A right here. And I, G of A, it's, it's basically the exact same thing. You fix a group G, you put a group action on everything, you make your maps equivariant, and you can define the G, injective, G injectivity and G injective envelopes, yada, yada. And Hamana did a bunch of work on these objects back in uh, the late 70s and the uh, early 80s where he basically studied them, and the, one of the most important things that he proved is that, you know, they always exist, even though in the back of your mind it's an axiom of choice construction. They're very unique, and they have very, very nice properties such as rigidity, essentiality, so on and so forth. Monotone completeness, uh, blah, blah, blah. 
Alrighty, so wh why are these useful, really? Well, let's, let's just take an example of what, uh, what the characterization of simplicity looks like in the commutative setting. So the characterization in terms of the dynamics on X itself, for C of X cross G, is very, very complicated. But if you just pass the, the G injective envelope, which is still gonna be a commutative C star algebra, it's gonna just be some C of Z in the end, then simplicity of the cross product is a very nice condition. It's equivalent to the action of G on Z being free. It doesn't get any nicer than that. And this is sort of what, uh, what Kennedy and Schaffhauser thought. Like, let's, let's just try to take this characterization on the G injective envelope and just say, is there a non-commutative analog of freeness? And can we hope for the best to get the, to get the same result, that it's equivalent to freeness? So what, what actually is non-commutative freeness? Well, let's, uh, I'll just mention at the start that for actions on arbitrary C star algebras, there is a definition. In fact, there's probably like 10 different definitions that are all shown to be equivalent, but they all use some very, very complicated definitions. And I don't, I'll touch on them eventually, but I don't want to touch on them yet. Just know that it's a generalization of what it means to act topologically freely on a compact house star space. But for now, we can actually restrict to a very, very nice class of C star algebras called monotone complete C star algebras. And your intuition should be that, okay, monotone complete is basically the same thing as being a von Neumann algebra, almost. So for example, commutative von Neumann algebras are Borel functions, modulo functions supported on null sets coming from measures, and commutative monotone complete are also Borel functions, modulo functions supported on null sets where the null sets don't necessarily come from measures. Very, very similar there. And at the end of the day, why am I talking about monotone complete? Well, very important. I of A and I G of A, regardless of what A is, those two are always monotone complete. And so we can take full advantage of that. So what is, uh, you know, again, freeness in the classical setting, at least let's, uh, let's look at what it looks like in the monotone complete case, because there sh things should be nice. If you take any automorphism on C of X, where really this is just a, a continuous uh, bijective map on X, you can always decompose the space as the fixed points and the not fixed points. And this really is a nice decomposition of your space because in the monotone complete setting, actually the fixed point set and its complement are both clopen subsets. So you really are writing X as a disjoint union of these two things in this setting. So you have the part where alpha acts trivially and the part where alpha acts freely. And okay, we want a non-commutative generalization of this. So, okay, maybe we write things in terms of the C star algebra. That's also not hard. You just say there's a largest alpha invariant projection such that on the corner corresponding to that projection, so C of XP, the action's trivial. And you have sort of the free part. That's that second direct sum over there, C of X one minus P. And keeping this in mind, we're ready to define non-commutative freeness. So in the non-commutative setting, Let's, let's take the same thing. So we have an automorphism alpha on A, at least a monotone complete Seaster algebra. As it turns out, the right notion of acting trivially on your Seaster algebra that's gonna play nicely with all the theory in this setting is actually acting inner. So there's a largest projection such that on that corner, you act inner. And your Seaster algebra is gonna decompose as a direct sum of two parts. You're gonna decompose into an inner part and the stuff that's left over, we call it the properly outer part. Although it was originally called freeness by, uh, by Kalman, who introduced this notion. So we have a, just like we have a trivial and free part, we now have an inner properly outer part. And we'll call the automorphism properly outer if there's basically no inner part whatsoever. So the entire C star algebra that it acts on, it's a, it's a properly outer action. And of course, uh, for, for group actions as well, which is, I think we're interested in, uh, you know, the action's called properly outer if every single group element except the obvious one is, is properly outer. And like I said, this was defined by Kalman in the 60s, so it's not a new definition by any means. And yeah, let's see, let's see how all things work out. So Kendi and Schaffhauser, they immediately were able to prove that if the action of G on IG of A is properly outer, then the cross product is simple. But as I mentioned, it's sort of a partial result because the converse requires some very strong assumptions. 
And in particular, they showed that if you have a sort of untwisting of a cohomological thing, then you get the converse. If the C star algebra is simple, then the action had to be properly outer. But as I mentioned uh, before, this is kind of a very, very strong assumption. And in fact, when I, when I was originally writing the paper with Shirley, I got, I got a little bit of permission to, from Matt to throw him under the bus a little bit and really emphasize the fact that this has finite dimensional counterexamples to this vanishing obstruction condition. And if you ever have a conjecture that you want to test out on cross products, always test it out on, on this uh, specific example right here, because chances are if the conjecture is false, it falls on this counterexample. No, it's not, it's not a counterexample to your theorem. It's a, it's, it's a counterexample to the assumption that vanishing obstruction would always hold, which you, you also pointed out in your paper that it doesn't hold exactly with this example right here. But yeah, so let's take M2, everyone's favorite non-commutative C-star algebra, and let's take uh, the Klein-4 group acting on it. So you got two generators U and V here, and let's say one of them acts by add this matrix, not that important, and the other one acts by add this matrix right here. So very, very clearly not a properly outer action on A. And in fact, okay, you might ask, wait, what's, what's going on here? Why A, why not I, G of A? Well, because of the fact that this is finite dimensional and G is also finite, it's very straightforward to check that actually all the injective envelopes coincide. There's no, no shenanigans going on there. So like I mentioned, the action of G on I, G of A is, uh, is not properly outer, but the cross product in this setting is, is very simple. It's isomorphic to M4. So this is exactly what Matt was pointing out. This is an example that shows that vanishing obstruction doesn't always hold, because in this case, the converse fails to hold. Alrighty. And what exactly goes wrong in this example? Like, why, why do you need vanishing obstruction, and why, why doesn't it even always hold? And let's just get a little bit into the proof of Kennedy and Schaffhauser. Not, not too much, but a little bit to see you know, what, what me and Shirley also took a little bit of inspiration from. So as I mentioned, there's always a faithful canonical expectation from the cross product back down to A. And as it turns out, something that's very, very useful for characterizing simplicity of cross products is something called a pseudo expectation. So it's the thing that you get when I say, maybe it's not an expectation onto A, but I enlarge my codomain here to be all of IG of A. And it should still be the identity on A. So by the identity, I really mean the canonical inclusion. And also I'll slap, a, I'll slap an equivariance condition on this for good measure. And this is something that Kendi and Schaffhauser observed. And if you're new to injective envelopes, this is actually a good exercise. It's only a few lines in, in each direction. That the cross product simple if and only if every pseudo expectation is faithful. So you get a very, very nice characterization that way. And you've broken down the problem of simplicity to just understanding pseudo expectations. So let's try to do that. What, what do pseudo expectations look like? So pseudo expectations, they look like the following. The first thing I notice is that all I need to know is where do the group elements get sent to? It's a multiplicative domain argument that once I know where these things get sent to, I know the entire map. So these should be pretty important. And what can we say about where they get sent to? I'll just call each of the images of lambda t, I'll call it xt. Well, first of all, xe should be one. That's just the map being unital. Second of all, because of the fact that your lambda t's implement the action on i, g of a, then so do the xt's in a certain sense, except the xt's are not exactly unitary, so conjugating by xt isn't exactly gonna play nicely, but it still is, is gonna implement the action in the sense that if I try to commute xt around anything, I get, uh, I get the action. So xt y is the same as t y x. And this third condition is just an equivariance condition. It just follows from G equivariance of the map. And the fact that it's unital and completely positive, it, this is just the, exactly the, the positivity, positivity condition that you need uh, on your coefficients. But for Kennedy and Schaffhauser, two is really the important one because as I mentioned, proper outerness is asking whether or not you're inner on any component of your C star algebra. And you can't exactly see, is, is anything inner immediately from this over here, except there is a bit of a polar decomposition trick that was originally done by Kalman again in the 60s, that if you have anything like this on a sufficiently nice 
thing, so for example, a von Neumann algebra, or more generally a monotone complete thing, you can take polar decomposition and you can actually genuinely get a unitary with support projection being a central projection, yada, yada. And that unitary implements, implements your uh, action there. So in other words, if G acts on A, or sorry, IG of A properly outer, then all of these unitaries here have to be zero, which means that all of these, uh, all of these XTs over here had to be zero as well. But if you just stop and think about it for 10 seconds, all these XTs being zero, except of course the trivial one, this is just saying that your only pseudo expectation is the canonical one, which was faithful to begin with. So that's, uh, that's sort of the easier direction. And the harder direction that takes a fair bit of work, and I'm gonna sweep a lot of details under the rug, uh, is that if you start with something that's not properly outer, can we try to build a pseudo expectation that's sufficiently awful that it actually turns out to be not faithful? And okay, so let's start with something that's not properly outer. Every automorphism in the group decomposes the C-star algebra into an inner part and a properly outer part. And let's just choose a unitary inside of here that actually implements the automorphism on the inner part. And Kennedy and Schaffhauser's vanishing obstruction is more or less the statement that if you choose your unitaries in such a way so that the map sending T to UT uh, is vaguely looks like a group of morphism, I'm sweeping uh, details under the rug there, then you can actually write down a pseudo expectation that sends lambda T to UT. This turns out to be a valid, completely uh, valid map. And it's sufficiently awful, and it turns out to be not faithful. And this contradicts simplicity. But you can probably see what's starting to go wrong, even with the M2 example, that this, this, is, a bit of a, this is a bit of a strong assumption on your unitary's UT. It's a very cohomological type of obstruction, and not always is it possible to untwist your unitaries. Alrighty. So moral of the story, proper outerness is too strong you need a different version, maybe a little bit of a weaker version. And this is where we actually get into the work that, uh, that me and Shirley did. So I'll just spoil it right off the bat. We get quite a few different uh, results. Probably the, more, uh, the most marketable result really is simplicity of the cross product for the large class of FCI percentual groups. But we do get various other uh, variations on that result. And they always share the same characterization. The only thing is like each one has very different obstructions in the proof that you have to work around. Now, to get a little bit of inspiration on how the proof for everything should work, you start out in the easiest case possible that you can solve. And that actually turns out to be, for a nice class of groups, contains all abelian groups, it's the case of every conjugacy class being finite. And in this case, you can actually do not too much work to characterize, uh, to characterize simplicity. And afterwards, you ask, Okay, actually I should mention, you do not too much work to characterize simplicity in terms of the dynamics on the G-injective envelope. And then you do the harder work, which is, okay, I have something on this awful axiom of choice object called IG of A. Can I push it down to things that are easier to understand? Ideally, I would like to get down to A, but it's hard enough to get down to I of A first so that I'll split that one off as completely separate. So going from IG of A to I of A takes a bit of work. And then going from FC groups to FCI percentual groups, that's actually a little bit non-trivial as well. So FCI percentual, I should mention, it's a very large class of amenable groups that it includes all your virtually nilpotent groups. And you know, if the group is finitely generated, there's, uh, you can say it's the same as the class of virtually nilpotent. It's the same as polynomial growth. It's probably the same as a few other classes as well that I don't remember. Shirley, Shirley knows the group theoretic uh, buzzwords quite a bit better than me. And you can also, scrap the minimality assumption, in fact, and characterize the next best thing, which is called the intersection property, uh, which I'll get into a little bit as well. Uh, this, this can only be done in special cases, so don't worry too much, especially if you don't like uh, non-minimal actions. And of course, there's one burning question that should be left in your mind. If I can go from I, G of A to I of A, can I actually go all the way back down to A and get something nice? And this turns out to be by far the hardest part of our paper. And it cost both of us quite a little bit of sanity. And I saved that one for last. Alrighty, 
as I mentioned, complete spoiler alert, all the characterizations have, are exactly the same. So I'll just mention it for, for the nice, uh, the, probably the nicest result. If G is FCI percentral, and you want to characterize simplicity. And in this case, I would actually say writing things down in terms of the negation is probably a little bit nicer. So the cross product's not simple if and only if something goes wrong. And there, the negation makes the thing that goes wrong a lot nicer. So not simplicity is equivalent to the following. There's a group element in your FC center of the group, the set of all elements of finite conjugacy class. There's a projection on I of A, or if you want I G of A, it's gonna be the same characterization. There's a projection in I of A, that's T invariant, and there's a unitary on that corner of I of A, such that T acts by add U on that corner. And now, if I were to not click this button anymore and just pause right here on the slide, this would be a little bit of a red flag because this would be saying, okay, non-simplicity is equivalent to the action at least of the FCI, or sorry, the FC center of G not being properly outer, right? It's just saying there's an element that acts inner on a corner. But as we saw with the M2 example, that can't possibly be the characterization. So we need a little bit of extra condition there to actually make this work. As it turns out, the missing condition is exactly this invariance condition right here where I need this unitary U to be invariant under all the elements that commute with, uh, with T. And that's it. That actually gives you the true if and only if. And yeah, this is, this is exactly what I said. The red thing is exactly what makes you go from proper outerness to the if and only if characterization. So okay, what goes into this proof? Always, always, always in the back of your mind, IG of A is very easy to work with in theory. And things get progressively harder as you move to smaller objects that look closer to A. So you start on IG of A, and then you end at A, ideally. So let's take a look at the action just on IG of A for now and see if we can characterize things. So let's just go jump right into it. I'm gonna assume the group is FC and I'm gonna try to characterize non-simplicity. So non-simplicity told me that there is a non-faithful pseudo expectation. I don't, I don't even need the not faithfulness part. I just need it to be non-trivial. And let's take a look at these coefficients in a little bit more detail. And for Kennedy and Schaffhauser, they focused on this second condition right here. But as it turns out, if you focus on two and three simultaneously, you actually notice something very, very interesting about these two conditions. And that's the following. So completely coincidentally, if I ask, when does an element of the center of this cross product right here, or sorry, when does an element of this cross product lie in the center? It's exactly when those two conditions are satisfied. So in other words, if I had a non-trivial pseudo expectation, I, morally speaking, should be able to write down an element of the center here by just writing down this exact sum, sum of xt star lambda t, and show that ig of a cross g is actually not simple in a very strong way. But I can't actually sum infinitely many things in general. Something might go wrong, it might not converge, yada yada. But I notice that if g is entirely finite conjugacy classes, then I can just restrict my attention to a finite conjugacy class and still write down the sum, and it still shows up to be a very non-trivial element of the center of this larger cross product. So just to summarize things, for FC groups, the following are completely equivalent. Non-simplicity implies I get non-trivial coefficients that satisfy this and that, which implies that I G of A cross G is non-simple in a very, very strong way. And in fact, uh, it was also shown, I, I think it was shown by Brider that actually the third condition, even just this not being simple, implies the first. So you get a full loop of the equivalence right here. And of course, this is starting to look a lot like our, our characterization from before, except that used unitaries. That didn't just use uh, arbitrary uh, elements xt. The way you get to unitaries is again, you do polar decomposition. So any xt, because this is a monotone complete C-star algebra, you can take polar decomposition and you get your unitary that satisfies all of the properties that you want. So okay, FC groups and IG of A, not too bad so far. It just gets, uh, it just gets worse from there. So how do we go to I of A? And this is actually where things are, things get a little bit interesting because 
Hamana wrote down a bunch of results and a bunch of objects that I really think flew under the radar for the longest time, just because people didn't really find too much of a use for them until uh, about 10 years ago from Briard, Kalantar, Kennedy, and Ozawa, where people really saw the magic of injective envelopes. So, okay. I have a bunch of C-star algebras here. I have a bunch of inclusions. The first three on the bottom, these inclusions should be fairly obvious because A was contained in I of A was contained in I G of A. Now, therefore, the cross products have a containment as well. But this fourth inclusion actually is very, is very interesting, and it was also proven by Hamana, who showed that I G of A cross G embeds by an injective star homomorphism into the injective envelope of A cross G. So as a consequence, all of these things right here are gonna share the same injective envelope and therefore they're very, very closely related to each other. They're gonna share a lot of properties between themselves. And also, a fourth one that I'd like to introduce here is something that Hamana defined and really flew under the radar for the longest time. It's, it's the monotone complete cross product, where what exactly is this? So as a little bit of intuition, let's say I have a C-star algebra B and I have a cross product B cross G. It's just various sums of the form uh, xt lambda t. Now, the monotone complete cross product is what you get when you ask, okay, what happens when I just try to write down all possible sums xt lambda t that actually are bounded in you know, the canonical spatial representation? And as it turns out, this thing is not a C-star algebra in, uh, in general. If B is a von Neumann algebra, then it's a von Neumann cross product that you get. But actually, if B is monotone complete and you just take a little bit of care to define what's the multiplication on this set using a sort of monotone complete order convergence, then this also becomes a valid C-star algebra and it contains the reduced cross product. So I can embed I of A cross G inside of the monotone complete cross product as well. Again, the takeaway that you should have here isn't what are all the details of these things. The takeaway is that all five of these Seaster algebras are very closely related to one another, and I can pass properties back and forth from one to the other. So in particular, I had some results characterizing things in IG. I want to try to pass things around back and forth until finally I end up back in I of A somehow. So let's see how that works. So exactly what I said, start with not simple, yada yada, you proved that I G of A cross G has non-trivial center. So it's not simple in a very, very strong way. I can't pass non-trivial center directly, but what I can pass is primality. It was a result of Hamana that A is prime if and only if its injective envelope's a factor. So this thing has the same injective envelope. That's not a factor. But then I can pass that back to I of A cross G. And non-primality of that actually turns out to also imply that its monotone complete cross product is not a factor. So don't worry too much about the details. I'm just passing properties back and forth between very closely related C-star algebras. But the consequence is that we had these xt that lied in IG of A, which form part of a non-trivial central element, but I finally passed them down to something that's a cross product of I of A, essentially. So I get coefficients yt and I of A with the exact same properties that we're interested in. And so we get exactly the same characterization from before, where you just erase I G of A and write I of A instead. All righty. So what about the intersection property as well? Again, a little bit of a, just an interesting side case, even though it's not that important to the rest of the main results. If, uh, if the action of G on A is not minimal, then the cross product can never be simple, because anytime I have a G invariant ideal in here, I get an ideal of the cross product. So the next best thing is actually something called the intersection property, which says that if I have an ideal in the cross product, it should always intersect A non-trivially. And this might seem a little bit strange at first, like why is this the next best thing? Well, it's a result of Sierkowski that more or less, not exactly this, but morally speaking, this is close enough to saying that every ideal of the cross product is of the form uh, I cross G. You might need some exactness assumptions, you might need some intersection property on all quotients, blah, 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 but morally speaking, this is what it says. And as it turns out, you can make the exact same proofs from before work with a lot more technicalities. So we had not simple, not prime, not factor, passed back and forth between a bunch of C-star algebras. Uh, 
as it turns out, you need to change those. You need to change those to play very nicely with the inclusion of A into these cross products. It takes a bit of work, but it can be done at the end. And so you do get the same exact characterization. Alrighty. So in general, if you were paying attention, I saw I wrote on the slide that for FC hypercentral groups or all of our results in general, everything reduces down to the FC center. And so far we were dealing with only FC groups where everything was F, the, the whole thing is the FC center. So how do you work with larger, larger classes of groups? Well, let's see this. So for the FC hypercentral case, originally we had a proof that reduced from the FCH center to the FC center that very, very closely mimicked a proof of Beto's anomaly for twisted groups Easter algebras until uh, Ekterhoff actually very kindly pointed out to us that there's an old result of his from, from his PhD thesis, in fact, very nice thesis. And this is a very special case of his result. It's much more general relating prime ideals to maximal ideals and blah, blah, blah. But in a very special case, if G is FC hypercentral, the cross product is simple if and only if it's prime. And we saw primality was one of the things we could actually pass back and forth very easily between various algebras. So, okay, let's just try to characterize when this cross product is prime. So here, G is absolutely any group whatsoever. And really, we're only interested in the FCH case, but it is interesting to note that we can actually prove our results for, for arbitrary groups here characterizing when things are prime, so long as the action's minimal. Now, again, same techniques, same implications, pass back and forth eight times or whatever it was. You start with not prime, you eventually get that this monotone complete cross product is not a factor, and we get our coefficients in I of A from before. But we need them to lie in the FC center. So how do you do that? Now, two separate cases that I'd like to focus on. First of all, yeah, exactly what I said. Two separate cases. First of all, the amenable case. If you're only interested in FC hypercentral groups, this is good enough, and the proof is much simpler. So let's just say, okay, let's, let's take a G invariant state on, uh, on I of A, and let's compute ZZ star. And notice that this coefficient right here is the sum of YT star YT. So again, multiplication of these things works as you expect in the monotone complete cross product. You just need to be worried a little bit about, you know, order convergence of the coefficients. But otherwise, it mostly behaves how you expect. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm a little suspicious of this thing right here if I try to apply phi to it. Because phi of yt star yt is completely constant on all of our conjugacy classes from before. This is just a consequence of this, uh, this one little equivariance condition right here. So in other words, phi of this thing can only be bounded if, uh, if all these things are zero whenever T actually generates an infinitely conjugacy, infinite conjugacy class. Because otherwise you would be summing infinitely many copies of the same non-zero positive element. There's no way that uh, that would ever give you something bounded. So in other words, we've reduced down to the case where we're just interested in the, uh, in the coefficients in the FC center. Everything else actually turns out to be zero. And this is where we use minimality here. So as long as phi of yt star yt is zero, by minimality, you actually get that this state is faithful and you actually conclude that the yt's are zero on the infinite conjugacy classes. So not too hard of a proof. And as I said, if you're only interested in the FCI hypercentral case, this is fine. I'll very quickly sketch the argument, and not even sketch, uh, maybe just very vaguely hint at how it's gonna work in the non-amenable case. So in this case, we don't have G-invariant states. The best thing that you have is G-equivariant maps into the G-injective envelope. And this is C of a very special space, which is either called uh, the Furstenberg boundary, because the Furstenberg originally studied it from a topological perspective, or the Hamana boundary, which, uh, because, uh, you know, Hamana defined injective envelopes. And as I mentioned, we only have a G equivariant map, and the consequence of equivariance and not invariance is that this map is actually no longer constant on conjugacy classes. So you can no longer say that you're summing together infinitely many copies of the same non-zero thing, but you can show by magical properties of the Furstenberg boundary right here that you still can't add together infinitely many distinct translates and expect to get something bounded. 
So you still get the same thing that it's going to vanish on elements of infinite conjugacy class. And so you still conclude that your YTs were only supported on the FC center to begin with. A lot of details swept under the rug there. Uh, bah, under the rug there. This is really a one and a half page argument. All righty. So that was our characterizations from before, all in terms of the injective envelope, as we saw. So now you can ask yourself, is there a nice characterization in terms of the dynamics of G on A itself? And first of all, the thing you should notice is that, okay, we basically took the definition of proper outerness and we slightly modified it for our purposes. So let's ask, is there definitions that of classical proper outerness that you have on I of A and you can convert to something on A? And the answer is, of course, yes. As I mentioned, this, is, this was done by, uh, you know, uh, Kishimoto, uh, George Eliot, and Olson and Peterson, where they showed that there are definitions that guarantee the cross product is simple, yada, yada. And I'll just mention, like I said, there's basically like 10 different definitions, and n minus one of them are kind of awful, and this one's decent enough, where if I take, uh, you know, if I consider what did it mean to be properly outer on a monotone complete thing, so in this case, I of A, it was that, you know, or rather I should say not proper outerness is that it's inner on a central corner. So there's a central projection P that's invariant and on that corner there's a unitary that actually implements your action. For arbitrary C star algebras it's gonna look like this. So a lot of C star algebras don't have a lot of projections. In fact, some might say a lot of C star algebras only even have two projections. And the appropriate replacement turns out to be you consider ideals instead. So there's an alpha invariant non-zero ideal in A. And ideals are usually not unital, so they don't have a lot of unitaries either. Now, the replacement that actually turns out to work, and that's actually not as spooky as you would think, is, is the multiplier algebra. This is usually a relatively well understood object, especially even in the, in the commutative case. The multiplier algebra of C0 of X is just CD of X. And okay, you say there should be a unitary in the multiplier algebra, and you might not have that it implements your action dead on, but it should be close enough to, uh, to your original automorphism. In other words, the norm distance uh, between them should be less than two. So, okay. Now, let's see what the, uh, what the equivariant version of this is. Uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? Oh, I have some, oh, that's plenty. Okay. So let's see right here what the equivariant version of this is. Now, let's just try to translate the directly the same way it was done here. So I said our characterization was there is a T in the FC center and a projection in I of A and a unitary in the corner such that it implements the automorphism plus an equivariance condition right here or an invariance condition, I should say. So U is invariant under all elements that commute with T. And the way I wrote it, this is a little bit redundant here. Like I don't technically need to write down this condition, but because I wanna draw a parallel with, uh, with the not monotone complete version, with the version on A, I'll write it down and I'll, I'll literally biject between these conditions right here because these, these last two generalize very differently to what the conditions on A should look like. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Big, uh, big block of text. All right, so what's the version on A? It's the following. So there's a T in the FC center. No surprises there. Projection generalizes to ideal. No surprises there. Unitary in the corner generalizes to unitary in the multiplier algebra of the quote unquote corner. No surprises there. And such that the following. So slight surprise here. Alpha T should be approximately add U but I can't directly say a norm estimate yet. You'll see why in a second. But let's just say it's small. It's some epsilon one. And a bit more surprising, I can't say that the projection P from before was exactly invariant with respect to these things that commute with T. So the ideal J might not be exactly invariant, but it should be close enough. So in the sense that if I take SJ and intersect it with J, it should be essential inside of SJ and it should be essential in J. And really your intuition here is that, okay, 
in the commutative setting, this is saying I have an open set and I translate it and I intersect it. That intersection should be dense in both of the original open sets. So it doesn't really translate by much. And finally, also I can't require that the unitary is exactly invariant. It turns out that there's not that many unitaries in these things to guarantee that. But I will say that the unitary should be approximately invariant. So the norm distance between SU and U should be very small. Again, I can't tell you an exact estimate yet, but I'll just say it should be less than epsilon two. And why did I write epsilon one and epsilon two instead of giving you direct estimates? Well, as it turns out, they need to be jointly, jointly very small, where the correct thing that makes it work at the end of the day is some very awful expression in terms of nested square roots for epsilon one, and then plus epsilon two should be less than square root of two. And that makes the full equivalence work. Realistically, I, I didn't mention this, but I could actually take square root of two and replace it with anything smaller. So I can actually guarantee these are arbitrarily small if I really want to, but sort of the loosest bound that actually works is this square root of two right here. And I'll mention this was by far the hardest part of, of the paper. And it's a very roundabout argument that loses a lot of information. There's a lot of axiom of choice all the way through and the T, the P and the U in one half of the equivalents do not need to coincide with the T, the J, and the U in the other half at all. Like literally the T in one half and the T in the other half might be completely different T's. It's just axiom of choice to go from one to the other. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm a few minutes early, but I think I'll just stop there.